Guys, welcome back to another episode of Bar Shifts and Bullshit. I'm your host, Jay Bird, here with the lovely Lily Lavender, your favorite bartender, America's favorite bartender. And uh, we're going to talk about, for better or worse, pros and cons of bartending, things that, uh, things that are awesome about bartending and things that, you know, kind of chap your ass. Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> for me, uh, if we were talking about some cons, it's definitely going to be... Um, like sleepless nights. Uh, If you bartend in uh, your sleep schedule and your work schedule is going to be pretty damn sporadic. Uh, You can work anywhere from uh, like early afternoons until anywhere from 10 at night to two o'clock in the morning. And that's a struggle that most people have. So if you're an early bird like myself, that does throw a damper in your, like in your social life. It does, especially with me. I have to wake up every morning at six o'clock for my kids. Mm -hmm. So it gets, tiring there are days where i just want to roll back over and go back to sleep yeah we uh, we've been a huge i'm early up i'm uh, i'm usually up and moving right around nine o'clock i've got youngins too so they're i'm usually getting them ready for the bus and i'll roll back over and kind of take a nap i'm a huge fan of naps <laughs> i never thought like i used to make fun of my pops all the time for like lay around in his recliner uh-huh. and he'd be out in 10 minutes and i'm that guy i don't have i won't I won't get a recliner in fear of knowing that I'll never get out of it. Oh, my God. No, I love my naps. Like, I can take a 10-minute nap and be rejuvenated after 10 minutes. But um, I think the longest nap I've ever taken was four hours. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's times where, I'm, uh, where I can tell I've been in lack of sleep. You know, I had this weird span one time. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the story's not for the faint hearted, by the way. But, uh, so I had, I was, I was going to be off for three days. This never happens. I was three days off in a row and I blew it. I came home. I was like, you know what? I was like, I got a vape pen. I was got, I got CBD in it. <laughs> I've got gummies. I was like, and I've got, a, and I have a, I have, I have bud. So I was like, I'm going to, I was like, I'm going to smoke this. I'm going to eat this. And then I'm just going to, I'm going to see what happens. I slept for 14 hours, man. <laughs> Like woke up two days. Like I woke up into the half of my second day with drool all over my couch, and like oh I didn't even. I fell asleep sitting up. Like I was done. Oh my god! So uh, this work schedule is so irregular and all over the place that uh, like you you tend to either skip sleep or you have to learn how to readjust it. So naps is like one of our our biggest thing. So bartending can be very very exhausting. Mm-hmm. The amount of people you have to deal with. Everything you're constantly thinking, moving. You're never you never stop or slow down for anything. Well, nobody nobody ever really thinks about how much toll like your mentality takes on like takes on your body. Mm-hmm. Like you can lift. For me, like I could lift weights. I can go out and exercise, uh, play sports, and all this other stuff, and be physically tired. Yeah. And it has nothing nothing in comparison to what like your mental stability does. Like no, you, because this is all social. Like you're constantly talking to people. Yeah, you're constantly talking. You're constantly changing conversations or readjusting to certain mm-hmm. conversations figuring out how to get out of certain conversations and, or situations uh, or situations like you you're constantly on you're constantly like the lights have to be clicked which if you're like lily lavender over here and is just a social butterfly and have no problem always <laughs> talking and always having a good time which is great uh, if you're like me um you ha- you love your wind down time yeah. like yeah i so i i I had a buddy come up to me not too long ago and he started laughing. He was like, you know, I feel he's like, you're very social. He said, you do good in conversations. He's like, you're, he's, he's like, I enjoy watching you with guests. He said, but in my head, I feel like you go home and you just completely decompress. He's like, you're, I feel like you just shut down and you don't want to talk to anybody. And it's true. I, when I finally get home and I wind down, the last thing I really want to do is have a conversation. I just want to just crash and be done. Yeah. I I'm a little different. I equate my sleep time to my wind down time. Yeah. So it's all in one. Yeah. I don't, I, don't, I haven't figured that system out yet. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not but, um, but some of the pros to it, um, we we were discussing that you've served we we've both served on different occasions and it's nothing in comparison to bartending for us because we have like an experimental trial we get we have things that we like to play around with mm-hmm. we like to experiment like i've cooked in the kitchen for over six six to eight ish years it's almost about a blur at this point of how much i've been working in a kitchen but uh, one of my favorite things about cooking was experimenting mm-hmm. uh, uh being able to do different presentations and and like and being able to adjust different recipes things that i thoroughly enjoy and hope the public does too mm-hmm. uh, but the 
problem with cooking is you never really get to see people's reactions unless you're in an open face kitchen, which I hate because I, I like to scream and yell at staff. Like when I cooked, I was a different bird back then. Um, but being able to experiment and show something and actually see people's reaction is not something you get to do as a cook. No. But as a bartender, you get every every bit of that. You, yeah, well, and see, that's why I don't like serving. Serving is because you're just bringing things to the customer. Yes, you're catering to the customer too. But at the same time, you're not making any of that for your customer. You're just giving them an experience of, you know, trying something that somebody else had made for them. Mm -hmm. So I don't like serving. I don't have any gratification from being a server. But I do as a bartender because I've created that cocktail. I've tried to figure out what cocktails they like, what cocktails they drink normally. And just going based off of that. Yeah, definitely a big psych battle between you and the yeah. guests. Like, uh, the, I've had people come up and tell me they like stuff on the sweeter side or the bitter side and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, they really don't know what they want, so we have to play around until we get it right. Uh, one of my favorite things in a huge flex that we've discussed is, um, is being able to take a bad cocktail or something that somebody doesn't enjoy and being able to flip it into mm -hmm. something they love. And it's not even about recreating that cocktail. It's about taking that existing cocktail that was bad and changing it. Yeah, all of a sudden we're just filling in the blanks or completing the puzzle. And uh, for, I mean, not to get too and too crazy with it, but it's definitely our Indiana, Indiana Jones moment where you yeah. get to make those adjustments. Uh, but, and uh, it's, it, like I said, it's a huge flex and it opens up a whole lot of different doors for different people. And they start to find things out about themselves. They didn't, they didn't know. And I, I all of a sudden turned into one of your favorite bartenders. <laughs> you know, I play around. Speaking of that, um, that's one of our flexes with bartending. But at the same time, when you come into situations as far as a con, uh, you definitely get hit on male or female. It doesn't really matter, mm -mm, but you, you, it's almost guaranteed you're going to get hit on by somebody you don't like yes. or somebody that, yeah, is definitely somebody you don't like. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you got to kind of save face. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss this actually very, very soon in one of our upcoming episodes on how to get out of situations like this. Yeah. But, um, uh, uh, it has been a constant struggle uh, for people in the bartending world to get out of situations oh, and, and, and still, and still keep a good customer base. Yeah. Like, uh, you can't, you can't get hit on somebody you don't like and then just destroy them. Yeah. Cause you're not trying to lose your customers. You're trying to build a foundation and keep them coming back and giving them a reason to keep coming back. Besides the fact that you look great, you're good at what you do, mm -hmm. but it could be a good conversationalist or something, yeah. or they cater to you really well. At the same time, you got to be able to you got to be able to draw a hard line, letting in, uh, letting people know that you're just their bartender. Yes, and I have a really good story about that one, uh, and I'm going to save it for tomorrow. I can't wait. It's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> I do like this story because I it comes down to a big situation where I was right, <laughs> and we all know how much I like to be right. <laughs> sometimes, whatever. Uh, yeah, sometimes. I'm always right. Uh, if anybody's curious, I'm always right about the situation. But I wasn't a bitch about it, so it's all good. No, she's good. And I'm not saying that you have to be. We'll discuss this later. <laughs> but, yeah, it definitely, it definitely comes down to a hard situation where you have to draw a hard line without losing your customer base. And that's a skill all to itself. Because I've seen so many bartenders come out there and just be angry. Oh, God, yes. And just be like, listen, stop. This is annoying. You're, I don't like you. And then, like, destroy a customer base. You lose two or three people like that. You and, really do. and then the reason for being is, like, you lose – if you lose one like that, that's bad. Mm -hmm. But if the public sees you absolutely – publicly destroy somebody in their self-esteem mm -hmm. they're going to be worried that they're the next one if they try to make any moves and you don't want to and that's less money out of your pocket uh I'm not trying to say swindle your customer base but it is your job to kind of put on a show and i mean we've talked about this in a previous episode but how you appear, how you act, how you are as a bartender. Sometimes you're the only bartender or sometimes you have other people that you have to work with. But like whatever is going on around you in your workplace, you have to be able to not show that and allow that to affect what you're doing as a bartender because it your customers feel it. Yeah, absolutely. There's always a vibe. Even on my bad days, uh, like I can still put on a smile, I can still put on and say face, but um, 
vibes are a real thing. They are. Um, people, people know when I'm not in a good mood. Mm-hmm. I usually get, I don't want to say I get better tips, but uh, people still accommodate me in a different, uh, in, in a good way. If they know that I'm having a bad day and they can feel it, uh-huh. but I'm, but I'm still putting forth the effort to make their experience memorable. Exactly. You know, uh, and you're, you're one of the biggest empaths I know. Like, you know, when I'm having a bad day before I even say anything, I usually don't even have to say two words and you're like, ah, oh, so like, what's the matter? <laughs> uh, and that's part of, that's a good bartender set. Like that's, that's important for a bartender. That's a good trait. Being able to feel your customer's mood as they walk in. Mm-hmm. And you can make your adjust uh, adjustments accordingly. Like you don't have to hound somebody completely. If they're, if you know they're having a bad day, just feel them out and figure out where it can lead. In. And you can flip moods. It's hard. It's difficult. But uh, but it's so much fun when you do it. Oh, yeah. Then they all of a sudden they forget about life's problems. And that bar, people go to the bar to forget life. They do. Uh, they, they either want to get, they either want to ha- enhance a really, really positive experience they've had in their lives. Or they want to forget a really, really bad one. Uh, so you're going to get the height of both sides. So, uh, so it's definitely good to be able to have the ability to flip moods or to adjust to it or to make a huge experience and congratulate somebody for their, you know, for their accomplishments. And this time of year is one of the times that you're going to go through a lot of that. You're going to have a lot of customers that are in their feelings or they're pissed off because they spent too much money for Christmas or they have to dish out more money for after New Year's. Or it's the holidays and people are just, and it's a lonely time of year for a lot of people. Like you, you see a lot of people out here that really advertise their relationships and it's kind of gross. I ain't gonna lie. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, people really like tell, how, uh, tell everybody how much they love them and they've been in these relationships for a decade. This is the best man that's treated me, uh, treated me well for a lifetime, even though you've seen them fighting in the parking yeah, lot two yeah. weeks later. Uh, it's, it's a very lonely time of year for people that aren't in those situations. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. Uh, I ain't saying, you know, show some leg or anything. I'm just saying like a little bit of flirting would benefit you. And then, uh, and it does help to be able to flip somebody's attitude toward life. Yes. But, uh, we'll discuss at a later date how this could be dangerous if you're not doing it with the right precautions. But, uh, some more, some more pros, to, uh, some more pros to the actual profession though is like, as, uh, well, money. Yeah, the potential to make a lot of money. Like, you get paid shitty wage as a bartender or a server. You usually make just minimum wage, but with being a bartender come the perks of tips. Yeah. Well, I've worked, uh, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. Uh, I've worked, I've been on an oil rig, I've worked in plastics factories, security. Um, there's not a whole lot that I haven't done. I've even worked for the Wildland Fire Department here in Cherokee. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've I've done that for a little bit and, uh, you know, this is where ADD really gets the better of me. I usually don't stick with a job more than a year and a half. Yeah. My longest job was cooking and it's because there's so many avenues that changes in, in, in the world of culinary. But, uh, bartending is definitely something I've stuck with a lot longer than any other job. And I, I definitely don't see myself doing anything further on. And I'll tell you why, um, when you're cooking, and for those of you in back of house, uh, my hat's off to you guys. I know what you're going through. Um, the only way you make more money is to work more hours. Yeah. Yeah, and it's where, and uh, it doesn't matter how much you grind or how much how much effort you put into it. You're gonna make the same amount of money either way. So if you're cooking for long periods of time and years, you really do have a passion and a love for it, mm-hmm. and you have to, or that's the only way you're gonna stick with it. Bartenders and in the service industry on the front side of those. Um, you can get beat down with so many customers all at once and, and your pay fluctuates uh-huh. to how you treat those guests in a shorter amount of time. Yeah. So where somebody in back of house has to put in extra hours to make those work. Yeah. We have to put in extra hours of service, but there's a bigger perk to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, people sees you struggle or people see how well you do under all that pressure and they tip you uh, tip you accordingly. Yeah. So your pay very well could change anywhere from, you know, like that thirty dollar an hour anywhere to like sixty dollars an hour, depending on how well you're treating your guests exactly. and how well they're treating you. I know this is a rough time for everybody, and I know our customer base doesn't tip the twenty percent or more like they should be. No, but um, you always do reach those guests that like have an extraordinary 
a very, very enlightened time and then really enjoy your service. And that, that's how you get regulars as well. People are excited to see you. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you can, if you can manage to swing all that, your, your tips will reflect. And then there's points in time I've, I've met servers take home, you know, six, $700 in a shift. Uh, -huh. uh and that's to themselves. Um, you know, and you just don't get that in any other job. No, you really don't. And then I also think that it just comes with people that sit down at a bar. They think that tipping accordingly at a bar is a little different than if you were sitting at a table where, I mean, you get more at a bar than you would at a table. Mm -hmm. You have 100% customer service right in your face the entire time you're sitting at a bar. Well, and one of my favorite lines is like, if somebody's telling me to experiment with something mm -hmm. or they're, they're like, if somebody tells me like, Oh, I like, a, I like a fruity drink yeah. or I like a bitter one or I like certain things. My favorite thing to do is be like, do you trust me? <laughs> and like for like two seconds, like for two seconds, they really think whether or not like it's a good idea to like put that in my hands. Yeah. All I'm doing is making a cocktail for you. If you don't like it, you know, we'll try it out. We'll figure it out. But, uh, I usually get a smile on the, like that, that little, little of level of cockiness mm -hmm. or confidence usually flips and they're like, you know what, let me see what you can do. And like, and nine times out of 10, it really doesn't matter what I throw at you. Most of them enjoy the drink because I'm confident in what I'm doing. Yeah. I've been doing this for a while. So I, like they expect something good. And you put on a show for them yeah. as you're making the cocktail. Yeah. Which I, I love flair. I think it's awesome. I think it's real cool. I am not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't stop me from trying every once in a while, like playing, flipping a shaker or two. Uh, it's definitely embarrassing when you drop it. <laughs> and my hand-eye coordination is not that great unless I'm playing video games, so I can't. Well, for me, everything's muscle memory. If I don't do it a thousand times a day, I'm not going to nail it. Yeah. And uh, you'll see me You'll see me flip a shaker every so often. You'll see me nail it, and then two seconds later, you'll see me drop it. It's because I don't do it every single day. Mm -hmm. It's usually like if I'm really feeling myself. And that's a good way to be humble is when you, <laughs> when you actually make a mess. So uh, for me... Uh, it, I definitely will get cocky and then I'll use speed to my advantage. If they see me confident and actually do swift moment of uh, movements and don't hesitate when you're pouring your drinks, just mm -hmm. nail it. Uh, it could be nasty. And most of the time, most of the times the guests will just like vote for your confidence and be yeah. excited about it. So they don't even really care about what the drinks is as long as there's alcohol in it. Well, and that's yeah. another thing too, is like alcohol, uh, You'll hear, you'll see a lot of guests get like different drinks, and we've discussed this a lot. Oh yes. That they'll they'll be like, well, I can't taste the alcohol in it. Uh huh. And so a good tip for me to get out of those situations is be like, good, I'm doing my job right. Yes. Yeah, because if it's a cocktail, it's not you're not supposed to taste the alcohol no, in it. No, you're really not. Yeah, you, it's supposed to be one of those things that gets you messed up and you don't even know it's coming out the door. So my favorite thing to tell these people that I've developed through the years when they say that they can't take taste the alcohol, they didn't make it correctly or they didn't put any alcohol in it. Um, I like to tell them, give it five minutes. You're about to feel it. Yeah. Be like, you ain't gonna be able to feel your face in, <laughs> in a series of seconds. Well, and that's what I always tell them. I'm like, listen, man, like yeah, that one's going to mess you up. There's like six different, and I'll, I'll exaggerate. They'll be like, there's six different alcohols in that drink, whatever. He's like, that's going to tear you up. Oh, He's like, yeah. that's, that's one of those things that come down smooth and, and wreck your life in the background. I, and then another one that I like to tell them is, um, well, that has a lot of alcohol in it. And if you can't taste it, I'm going to give you 30 minutes. If you're, if you're stumbling, going to the bathroom, or you don't want to take a drink of water, or you like spill something, then I know that that alcohol has hit you. You just couldn't taste it. And that's a good way to adjust your cutoffs too. Yes. Um, like if you need to make adjustments to like um, over, just make sure you just don't over serve. Mm -hmm. uh, if they can't taste alcohol, and you know, like if it's a Long Island or if it's a sex on the beach or something yeah. with one or uh, with two or more alcohols in it, you and they can't taste it. A you're good at what your job. You're like you're good at what you're doing because you're not supposed to taste alcohol in those drinks. Uh -huh. And B, make your adjustments accordingly because if they're drinking seven or eight of those and they complain they can't taste the alcohol, then they're they're, they're probably trashed. Trash. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're like beyond drunk. Oh, yeah, because I love my Jameson. I I, I love I, it's my favorite whiskey. I don't know why. Um, I think it's because it's affordable and I can and it's everywhere. <laughs> 
But uh, after about, if I'm like killing it and I have uh, have Lily here, Lily here to drive me everywhere, <laughs> uh, after about seven or eight of those, uh, you know, I can't taste it. <laughs> I don't know though. That um, proper twelve was hit me pretty hard the other night, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I like that. I, I I was I did not. I did I didn't hate it. I, I like that proper twelve. Yeah, I didn't hate it either, and it, it's just like I mean, it's similar. Yeah, to me, it's similar. It just doesn't have the afterburn like Jameson does. Mm-hmm. I I drank it again. Absolutely. Yeah. That's like ancient age to. To uh, Jack Daniels whiskey, I I used to drink Jack Daniels when I was younger all the time, and then found out that Ancient Age is half the price and yeah. just as much flavor. The only thing you don't get is the honey flavor, so, and that's something I can deal with that in my fine. life. Truth be told, the other thing I felt like Jack Daniels Tennessee whiskey is a little too sweet for me. So, mm-hmm. but I'm down to Ancient Age was just you know up my alley, <laughs> and it's still Kentucky. Well, Ancient Age Kentucky bourbon. Mm-hmm. I think, if I'm not mistaken. And then you got Tennessee whiskey. So it just depends on who you want to show support to on that front. And what kind of burn you want. Yeah. We're all about the burn. <laughs> all about the burn. All right. But well, another one of the cons, guys, is it's pre- here's where things get kind of pre- repetitive. Um, you're going to have to clean the bar every single night. Oh, yes. Um, where here's where it's kind of a perk to be a server as to a bartender like servers your your workload is usually a lot lighter than bartenders uh-huh. um bartenders and honestly like i said i've cooked in back of the house uh cleaning is about the same mm-hmm. uh, there's more to label there's more to put up in a kitchen in back of the house but bartending it's usually a fucking disaster yes. at the end of the day, at the end of the night as much as you try to keep it clean throughout the shift and if you're good at that that's a huge flex mm-hmm. when bartending uh, cleaning is exhausting and that and it's always that one finisher up or that last middle finger to your career when you have to <laughs> clean the whole bar by yourself so that's definitely that's definitely one of those things but and you got to keep in mind Everybody has to do it, and if you're cleaning down the bar, make sure everything's socked up and getting ready for the next shift. Treat everybody accordingly. Like you're not the only one that works there, mm-hmm. but it does. Think a lot. Does suck having to clean, deep clean everything at the end of the night. So, yeah, especially if you're the only bartender at your location and you work that night. Yeah, it can suck. You'll be the one getting out the same time the kitchen staff gets out, and servers are all gone already. Yeah, you get that lowly. That lowly walk of shame as you're leaving, yeah. knowing that, like knowing that you got to come back and do it again. And there's no one else to hold accountable if it if you don't clean it correctly, mm-hmm. if you don't break it down the right way. Like you come in the next morning, you're like, shit, I was the one that closed down. <laughs> it was definitely there's been definitely a couple of days where I was just like, you know what, I'll prep this tomorrow. Like mm-hmm. I won't need it tomorrow, and then I'll come in the next day and I'm like, damn, like I I shot myself in the foot. <laughs> Every time, never fails. Yeah, but uh, they, I mean, there's uh, it's definitely a roller coaster ride. Uh, a lot of perks, a lot of cons to both uh, both position. I think that's why this fits people with ADD a lot better too. It does. Um, people with ADD, people who love the social scene, like you are literally the center of attention when it comes to bartending, especially like at your place. You know, you can see into yours, so you can see who's working. You can see what kind of crowd you have around the bar. And then with mine, I'm in the middle of the restaurant, so, like, everyone can see me when they walk in. So it's very social. Um, There's, during the slow seasons, you know, you have nothing to do, so you walk around, talk to people, talk to people at the tables. And take advantage advantage of the situation. Uh, On slow days... Definitely meander a little bit, have mm-hmm. conversations. That's how you build regulars, and that's how you get a good, a better customer base. Uh, if you're hiding in the back, looking on your phone, and dicking around back there, customers see that, or yeah. they know, or they know. Um, it's good to play around and and do your research. If you got downtime, uh, study up on your cocktails. Study up. Uh, it blew my mind that I forgot how to make a redheaded slut the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't made a redheaded slut. Uh, since I worked at a dive bar, that's you. And I and like I said, I work in fine dining right now, mm-hmm. and I do miss making a, making the fun stuff. Yeah. You know? And everybody always laughs or laughs at me, or they ask me how to make the fruity drinks or the sweet drinks or whatever. And uh, I like doing that. I have a lot of fun with it. But 
I it just stumped me. Somebody <laughs> asked me somebody asked me for a redhead slut the other day and I like lost it. I was like, I have no clue what's in that. Oh, uh, and I was embarrassed because I had to look it up. But and then you'll have those days if you don't make it repetitively every single day, there's over thirty three hundred different cocktails yes, out there. Yes, there are. So, oh God. And then one day or just the other day when I was working with our new bartender, um, he didn't know how to make a blue Hawaiian. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's really simple. It's just like a Long Island, but take this out, use blue carrots out and Sprite. Mm-hmm. There you go. Oh, yeah. So definitely, yeah, definitely study up on your cocktails. It's, it's definitely, it's a huge benefit to know, yeah. know your craft. Uh, I tell you, that's how we do interviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't know the basics, then um, it's difficult for us to find us in a position where you're a good, suitable match to work in a bar we work at. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for, uh, unfortunately for us, hiring is usually not in our grasp, Mm -hmm. but that's how we adjust whether you're not, whether you're going to be a good bartender or not. And it does help us, uh, it does help us train you when we know where you're lacking. It definitely does. Like one of the questions that our executive chef likes to ask, um, potential bartenders is how to make a Manhattan. Now that wouldn't be my go-to drink. My go-to drink to ask somebody how to make would be an old fashioned or a long Island. Well, saying this is where we kind of differ. I feel like you guys would benefit from learning how to do something simple like, um, sex on the beach, long islands, Cosmo or cosmos. Uh-huh. Cause that, uh, that appeals to your market where you work now where I'm working, Manhattans, old fashions, yeah. Negronis are something I sell regularly, uh-huh. and it's a different. That's up. That I say upscale. It's 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 just a different style. Uh, if you're in fine dining and you want people to lay, like, if you're looking for cocktails that settle, you're going to sell cocktails that are more upscale, that mm-hmm. cost more money, um, that are a little bit more intricate to make or more old timey. Uh, I mean, yeah. old fashions and Manhattans were made in the early. 1800s yeah. those were established a long long time ago so those are things that people would find eloquent or uh, or yeah or more advanced because of their age and they expect you to know that in fine dining because mm-hmm. those are sipper drinks in different locations though like if for you for you and your uh, your location i would uh, i would do an interview based on cosmos sex yeah. on the beaches stuff that are quick fruity and send out to the kind of door because um because that's the kind of demographic that you get there it's it's just different people different places but that's how i would do my interviews too yeah based on all that stuff so um yeah but if i wanted if i'm checking somebody's experience i would definitely it's the basics. Mm-hmm. Like I, I can work. If you know the basics, then I can work off that. We can, yeah. we can do the advanced stuff. I know you, if you know how to make, if you're good at making a long Island iced tea, sex on the beach, cosmos, anything, anything of the sort, then I know that I can teach you how to make an old fashioned and yeah. a grown Like I can teach you the, the harder stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, if I know that you have base, uh, the basics down, and then, then for the person being interviewed, that's that should be exciting. That you get to learn be. a brand new craft. You get to advance a little bit further, and see it from a first first hand. I'd never made a sidecar in my life until I took this job here recently, <laughs> and uh, now I couldn't. Uh, unfortunately, now I couldn't forget it. You know, it's kind of one of those things that like I I enjoy make I enjoy knowing how to make it, but after you make three hundred of them, you're just like ah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I know. Okay, well, we're going to have to wrap this up because i got to get to work. But, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, please uh, uh, email us with any thoughts, concerns, or if you have any more suggestions, we'd appreciate it. And I love you guys. See you, see you next time.